Tonight, The Final Shape and Star Wars Outlaws both get new reveals, and the Coda remake is supposedly alive and well, at least according to one developer. All that and more in just a moment. But first, I want everyone to know this is an audience interactive podcast. So if you're watching live here at Twitch TV slash Game Points, or later at any myriad of video hosting platforms, please feel free to join the conversation with any questions, comments, concerns you might have. Just try to keep them germane to the topics on hand. First up on today's docket, let's go to Paul Tassie over at Forbes about some Destiny 2 Final Shape reveals that dropped today. Now, I do trust Paul Tassie's opinion on Destiny 2. This is kind of like his beat for the most part. Agree with him or not, sometimes I don't think he's on track, but for the most part, he is going to know what he's talking about, so I like to use him as a source. The link to this story and all the stories we're talking about, by the way, provided down in the description below or over on our Discord server if you want to go take a look at that. Headline, Destiny 2 reveals new final shape, enemy race, prismatic subclass, and exotic combination. So earlier today, the final shape kind of had a preview stream. They dropped a whole bunch of information on it. A lot of it stuff we kind of knew, the lot of teasing things are not coming out with, but they did mention some things out the gate. First, new subclass. This whole idea of a prismatic sub, uh, subclass. What that sounds to be is essentially you get to mix and match bits from every, sub, every class out there. So you could have like... Uh, Oh, I, I can't remember their actual class names. I would like Warlocks and stuff like that, but I can't remember what their subclasses are off the top of my head. But you can have, like, Void abilities or Fire abilities with uh, the Frost abilities. It's been a hot minute since I played Destiny. Forgive me. My main concern is that it actually might break the game a little bit if you're able to just kind of mix and match what's out there. And when you have no unified or no clearly divided lines between classes, what's going to happen, I, I feel, is everyone's going to be running the exact same thing. Now, there's always been metas, right? There's always been everyone is like a warlock meta, so it's going to have this gear on this one specific subclass. But every now and then, you might have someone get a little wild hair and go, hey, I'm going to try to do the solar subclass or the, the void subclass and see if I can't make something out of that. But if you can choose, pick and choose bits from all of them, there's no point in everyone just running the exact same thing. Good to have you, by the way, CT Boz. Uh, assuming that you play Destiny 2 as well. So while this sounds kind of cool, especially for the big climatic finale of what's supposed to be the light and dark saga with the final shape, the potential for just broken, broken combinations is high. And that might be by design. After all, if this is supposed to be the giant decade-long climax of the story they've been shaping since the first Destiny, ending with whatever is going to happen with the Traveler in the Darkness, then they would stand to reason they would give you the ability to just become extremely overpowered. Could be a final send-off before we see whatever shape Destiny is going to take next after the final shape. Also coming up is an exotic class item. If I can get to it right there. Exotic class items. Now, typically when you gear up in Destiny, you can pick one exotic. And the exotics have been... Well, one armor exotic, one weapon exotic. And the armor exotics have been helmet, armor, and boots. Your class item, a little bit different. Uh, class item varies from class to class. That's the same class item. So warlocks get like a bangle, hunters get a cape, and titans, who cares what they get? No one actually cares. Thank you very much for the gift sub, by the way. As far as an exotic class item, they've never really existed until now. I have to wonder how they're feeling with the drops for that, because if you're, I, I doubt you'll get an exotic warlock drop if you're on a hunter at the time, for example. But would it just drop as a hunter exotic class item? Eh, that's a mechanics question that I'm sure we'll get a little bit more idea when the game itself finally drops later on. I don't know if this is really going to do too much to move the needle as far as the gear grind goes, because if they still have the limitation of you only get to have one exotic item equipped at any time, then all that is is an extra slot making you choose between which one you want to take. Once again, meta comes into play. There's going to be something that everyone's just going to naturally gravitate to. Even more limited if they kind of just let you pick a little bit from every subclass to make your OP class that 
is clearly going to be what everyone's gravitating to. I know that this is one of those, it sounds like a contradiction almost, where by giving you more options to pick and choose how you want your character to be, they're going to be funneling everyone into the most optimized character. I don't know if this does anything to move the scale at all for the game itself. If anything, it might even restrict it more by opening it up. Once again, I know that sounds off. I know that sounds contradictory. That's just my feelings to it. Hey there, Dirk's Rad. Good to have you. Let's see. They're saying a mix mashup of subclass sounds like a desperate move. I wonder if this will be the end of the whole light story and something totally new powers your guardian in the future of Destiny 2. They have been very open at saying that the final shape is going to be the end of their big 10-year story of the light and darkness saga, I think they called it. And what comes after that, it's not that Destiny 2 is going away, but it is going to be changing how it presents itself. There will be a new... Thank you once again for the sub as well. It's always nice. Uh... There will be a new way content is dropped in Destiny 2. The less focused on expansions and more on, it seems to be seasons. Uh, I know they use a different term for it, I believe. It escapes me off the top of my head. But there will be a continuing story. It's supposed to just be the next chapter. They're closing the fight between the Traveler and the Darkness and opening up whatever comes next. As far as a desperate move, well, Bungie ain't doing too good. Uh, I don't think it's a secret that Bungie is kind of a sinking ship at this point. I wouldn't be surprised. My, my theory is that Sony will take it over after the final shape comes out. This preview did ignite interest in the game. Servers were actually clogged at the beginning of the day for some people. So there's still an interest in seeing how this concludes. But I get the feeling that even if the final shape does well... It's mostly going to be from people coming in going, okay, I've played Destiny 2 off and on for, for 10 years. I need to see how it ends. And when they finish up that last bit of content, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a lot of people just quit the game for good. Kind of the Marvel effect. When, and when Endgame finally dropped, people had 10 years of Marvel movies invested for the big final climax. So after Thanos got Thanos at the end of Endgame, the numbers for that entire franchise just dropped off of a cliff. Uh, it's over. And I don't have another 10 years to spend building up a new story. CT Boz asked if they laid off their... They, they did lay off a whole bunch of their staff after even saying they weren't going to be laying off staff because part of the acquisition deal by Sony was supposed to be an influx of cash to prevent having to do layoffs. Where that money went? I don't know. I'm also of the mindset that not too long after the final shape drops, you'll get another round of layoffs at Sony. Or, uh, Bungie, rather. I hope that's not the case. I know people that work at Bungie. I don't necessarily want to see their lives get upended, but it's a spooky time to be working there right now. Even if they don't have layoffs, I do not expect the C-suite level of executives at Bungie to remain with the company for much longer. I think they're going to push final shape out the door, and either they have mass layoffs or Sony comes in and just guts the executive level at Bungie. We'll see in a couple months for sure, though. Uh, back to chat again. It honestly seems Sony's deal with Bungie was a knee-jerk reaction to Microsoft's dealings. Sony's deal with Bungie was made during Jim Ryan's tenure as CEO, tenure rather, as CEO of Sony. Jim Ryan recently just left as, as CEO of Sony. Uh, not, C, not CEO of Sony. Head of PlayStation. To be very clear about that. Sony itself is a much bigger corporation. I want to be 100% clear on that. Uh, he was not the CEO of Sony as a megalith. He was the head of PlayStation Studio, uh, PlayStation Worldwide Entertainment, or whatever the hell it's called. Uh, and he was chasing live services. And he was spending high, high amounts of money to lock down Bungie. To get Naughty Dog making what was going to be Last of Us Factions before it got cancelled. Or whatever they were going to call Last of Us Factions knockoff before it got cancelled. 
And he ultimately paid for those bad calls with his job. Now, I know he says, oh, I'm retiring because I have to fly around everywhere. No one in that position retires, especially at his age. He could have gone on for another decade. He was pushed out. My belief is pushed out. There is one more bit of major news from the preview. There's a bunch of little side small stuff, but I'm focusing on the big boys here. And that is finally a new enemy race, the Dread. Now, it has been a hot minute since they've dropped an actual new race. And no, I don't count the Scourge and, or the Scorn and the Taken as new races. All the Taken in is a shadowy in a, uh, photo-negative reskin of many enemies that already exist, a few new abilities. And the Scorn are just undead fallen. And kind of cheaping out if you're considering those brand new races. But this, this is interesting. Uh, they are going to be inside the Traveler itself, if I recall call the actual storyline bits we'll absolutely see how that goes later on don't know too much about them but they did show off some of their abilities at the end of the day i don't know if they're really going to add too much variety to what we already have in destiny there's not too much you can really do to change things up on a pve stance unfortunately but hey credit where credit's due it's about time they actually added a new real new race to destiny they look a little bit like the race of the most recent raid. I can't remember his name. They look a little bit like him to a degree. I, I wish I could remember off the name of his top. Naz Nazarak, that's his name. Thank you very much, Dark in chat. Appreciate that. We should call him <laughs> Jim Lion. I heard, I've heard uh, Brian Jim Lion, because Lion Jim Ryan, uh, all kinds of variations of that. But yeah, that's... Uh, Definitely something people have been saying. Yeah, Nazarak. That's his name. That's his name. I think that was the final raid boss of that area. The, his race, I think, is called like the the the, the Rak Ruk Ka or something. But they definitely look like that, which is awesome. Thank God, Root of Nightmares, right? Thank you. Thank God they're actually expanding the enemy roster, though. I can only one of the reasons why I have fallen off Destiny, and if you couldn't tell because I don't remember all these names anymore. Uh, was, well, one, Bitefall came out, and that was just god-awful. But I was already kind of only a casual player at this point anyways, because I've been fighting the same three or four core enemies for ten years. Now, once again, yeah, we had the Taken, but the Taken are just photo-negatives of existing enemies. And the Scorn, which are... They're fallen. But let's be real here, they're fallen. They're fallen crossed of Hive, kind of, in their, their play style. This could be cool. I might have to actually dip back into Destiny 2. I'll get a video summary of Lightfall to see what I missed in the previous seasons, just to see how it ends. Which makes me... I, I doubt I'm alone in that, by the way. I think there are a lot of people who are lapsed Destiny players who have no interest in going back other than to see how the game actually wraps up. Which is why I think the player base is going to precipitously fall off a plateau after that final raid or season pass or season drops, I think once that happens, uh, let's just say Bungie Bear ha better have Marathon out the door by then. That kind of wraps up with the big, big things I want to talk about of Destiny 2's drop. There is the big preview if you want to take a look at the whole thing. I recommend you all do. But that was just the things that caught my eye, uh, and Cassie acknowledged most of them in his article there. Let's go ahead and move on to the next topic here of another game that got some more information out today. We go to Video Game Chronicle for this one. Star Wars Outlaws gets a new story trailer and release date as pre-orders go live. Let's just say it right now, the release date's August 30th, 2024. I expected it to be sometime in October, so a couple months earlier than I thought. Uh, they are doing that damn thing where you can pre-order it and get it for three days early. Uh, but in reality, what that means is if you actually want to play it on the day it really releases, you're having to pony up a little bit more money. Do not let Corpo speak make you think that you're getting a deal here. You're not. They're holding the game hostage for three days unless you pay that extra 10, 20, 15 bucks, whatever it is. Have I seen the price tiers? They're pushing Ubisoft plus hard. I have. Ubisoft is... Ubisoft is really in an odd state right now. I think that they're the most likely... If any of the big publishers were to collapse, I think Ubisoft is the most likely to collapse. 
They really haven't produced anything of note in quite a while. They are a bloated, ineffective team with studios all across the world that don't really communicate very well with each other. To get an idea of how many people they have on staff, just take a look at their most any of their most recent games and how many names are listed in the credits. I think Assassin's Creed, what was it, Odyssey was, no, uh, Valhalla. I think there was like five to 900 people total that worked on that game. Uh, it is unbelievably bloated. And I think a lot of that falls at the feet of the Guillemot family who runs Ubisoft and has been for years trying to fight off hostile takeovers from many a company, specifically Vivendi. But I think it's their arrogance and hubris that really prevents them from maybe stepping back a little bit and letting someone else who understands things run the ship a little bit better. But yeah, Star, uh, Ubisoft is in a very odd place. Back to Star Wars Outlaws. Uh, the story itself, more or less stuff that we knew already. Set between the events of Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, which is prime for Star Wars content because very little really touched on that. Uh, it does have that goddamn Marvel dialogue all over the place. You know what I mean. The everything needs to be distilled down to a sarcastic quip. Uh, it's like they are trying to make the main character a Han Solo 2 without understanding what made Han Solo Han Solo, rather than letting her become her own character. And that bothers the hell out of me. Now, I do like the criminal aspect as being the focus here. The last time we had a, a game that I am aware of that really focused on the criminal aspect of things was Shadows of the Empire, back on the Nintendo 64. So hopefully this doesn't have any Jedi or Sith or lightsabers or Force, and please, please do not connect this to the movies. A nod here and there is fine. Like, I think that one of the trailer shots had, you got to see Han Solo frozen in Carbonite because you pay attention to Jabba, you go, you go by Jabba's palace and he's in there. But don't let this heist that's being planned, because the overall theme of the game is planning for a heist, don't let it be something like you're stealing the Death Star plans or something like that. I am tired of the Star Wars universe being a mile wide but an inch deep, where you keep running into the same people over and over again. It's an entire galaxy. We can go a game without even name dropping Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker, for God's sakes. It's okay. You, you can do that. Take a quick look at chat here again, real quick. Dirk is rad says, I feel like Ubisoft has been speeding downhill since Valhalla. What a waste of the game. I agree. Uh, I think COVID really screwed them because they were a more than most publishers and developers. They were a international company that had studios all over the world, including most support studios kind of working in tandem on games. And when COVID hit, it really hampered their ability to do work more than other places would. You would think it would be a boon because you already had the remote work set up in a lot of these places, but it does seem to have just kind of caused chaos throughout their company more than other places. Uh, Ubisoft feels rudderless right now. They're, they're a, a ship adrift and... I'm of the mindset that you might see massive, massive, massive layoffs at excuse me, Ubisoft, more than the way they've gone, undergone so far. I think they are due for just a battering. Uh, and I don't say that enthusiastically. I'm not looking for Ubisoft to go away or anything like that. I just think the bill's coming due for them, uh, among many other studios. But I think, I think Ubisoft is the canary in the coal mine. If a big one is going to fail, it's going to be them first. Uh, Skull and Bones was a big pile of shit. Yeah, that was a lot of money wasted. The reason why Skull and Bones was even made, from what I understand, could be wrong, is that they got massive tax breaks from Singapore to create a game in Singapore. And they kind of said, yeah, we could do that, and they took the money and really didn't have much of a plan for it. And then you get Skull and Bones. It also went through multiple rewrites and revisions as Ubisoft went from big open worlds to live service games to dialing back on the live service to it just, it went under it underwent many scope changes over the course of that game's development you would sell your left arm for a dash rendar returns protagonist i am 
Well, now now you really can't go back to that because all that old canon is regulated to Star Wars Legends. It just doesn't exist anymore in the mainstream. But I am shocked that they never really did Shadows of the Empire 2. Star Wars Outlaws feels like they're trying to do Shadows of the Empire 2, but I'm really concerned about for that protagonist. Especially, like, like watch, watch the trailer. You'll see what I mean. They're trying to turn her into Han Solo, which, hey, we all love Han Solo. Han Solo's great. But they give her that, that... I best describe it as, uh, as uh, Marvel dialogue. Previously, it used to be that we Joss Whedon dialogue where the end of the world is treated with as much seriousness as breaking a nail in the morning, where everything is sarcastic, everything has to be a quip, everything needs to be some kind of one-liner. The, the most famous example of this in the Star Wars universe is that whole, they fly now? You know what I'm talking about. Or, that, or the whole, like, well, that happened kind of style of delivery. And... It is so tired and played out that I, I, I he, he even hear like a whiff of it. And it, it brings the entire experience down for me. We're, we're, we're done with that. Please give us something. It is okay to treat something serious. That is why I liked Rogue One so much. Rogue One actually was a Star Wars story written for a mature audience in mind it doesn't need to be like oh we're the 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 protagonists are fucking and an arm's getting cut off and blood's everywhere and i don't mean like that by mature but it was deep it i don't want to say deep it was deep for star wars uh it was dark uh they didn't try to they did they did not give it a happy ending at all uh it was hopeful but it wasn't happy and i i i know that Star Wars has it in it to actually produce stuff like that again. But I don't know if Disney is capable of doing it. I don't know if they are. Once again, thank you very much for the gift sub there, CD Boz. Uh, you've been really helping out the channel the, the past couple minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyways... What's your guys' hype level on Star Wars Outlaws? Let me know down below. Uh, once again, I do this to rant, but it is always helpful to hear what you all have to say about it. Moving on as we hard shift to the next story here, we go to IGN. Once again, all these stories will be in the description down below or over on our Discord server. Sony fixed exploit that let PlayStation Portal run emulated PSP games after hackers responsibly reported the issue to PlayStation. Now... A couple of Google engineers hacked the PlayStation Portal to run unauthorized PlayStation uh, PSP games. They talked about it online. A lot of people got upset at them, however, when they told Sony, hey, here's the exploit, this is how we did it, and then Sony closed it off and fixed it. Uh, to the article itself. One of the Google engineers who hacked the PlayStation portal to run emulated PSP games has said Sony has now fixed the exploit after his team responsibly reported the issues to PlayStation. A lot of people seem to take issue with the fact that they took away their ability to pirate PSP games, essentially. Or not, I don't even say pirate. To play PSP games on this thing because there, there's the whole white hat, black hat, gray hat debate in hacker communities. I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, I don't even pretend to understand it, to be clear. But people took umbrage with, with these Google engineers reporting it to Sony. Back to the article. In February, Andy Nguyen, who works at Google on cloud vulnerability research, and Callie Sevenson, a security engineer at Google, took to social media to show a PlayStation Portal running PSP game Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories natively. Sony released the PlayStation Portal as a handheld game and streaming device that wirelessly connects to the PlayStation 5. Officially, it's not possible to play games natively on the PlayStation Portal, but Nguyen, Co and, Co Nguyen and company hacked the PlayStation Portal to run the PPSSPP emulator, which meant that no Wi-Fi streaming was required, which is actually pretty big. At the time, Nguyen said the hack was all software-based, which meant the hard no hardware exploitation was not required, so you didn't have to add like a ROM chip or anything to it. 
but the team had no plans to release the hack. Now, Nguyen has tweeted to say the bugs are fixed to recent release 2.06 update after we, quote, responsibly reported issues to the PlayStation, end quote. I know a lot of people are salty about this, but if you want the PlayStation Portable to actually exist as a console, this needed to happen. Because one of the main reasons why the PSP and to a lesser extent the Vita were, were eventually offed and forgotten was because of how easily hackable they were and all the shit people could get away with on them. There were stories of people using PSPs, like hacked PSPs, to get like credit card information. Though what you could do with the PSP in particular was so goddamn wild that it became a legal time bomb for Sony. And their experiences with that in the Vita, I think, is one of the reasons why they have never made a, another handheld. And it's not, not because of poor sales, but because of the insanity the PSP specifically can get away with. In fact, I'd wager the guess the reason why the Vita had so much proprietary shit in there, we all mocked the Vita memory cards, for example, was because it was designed to get around hacking it. Uh, no, no micro SD card really limits on your ability to do that. You had to use that weird Sony, it was a tiny little bastard uh, thing to get in there, as well as the weird Vita cartridges. I think that's one of the reasons why they were so controlling with the Vita proprietary stuff is because they wanted to limit the, the, the financial damage if they were to get sued by someone over people packing the PlayStation Portable. It was, it was a thing. So, I get being salty at these Google. I get it. I do. But understand that if you want a Sony handheld, it can't be vulnerable. At least not in the way the PlayStation Plus was. Eventually, someone will crack the whole thing and do whatever they want to it. That is the way of all electronics. But the longer that it takes for someone to do that, the likelihood of Sony supporting that thing increases. I know it's a give and take. I get it. But let's not, let's not crucify these two Google engineers for doing the, quote, responsible thing. Uh, I don't even necessarily say it's responsible, but I can see this from a different perspective than what they're saying, but still be on their side. Back to chat here again. CT Boz asks, was that around the time the PlayStation 3 network went down for months because of hackers? It was around that time, but they're two completely separate instances. Uh, the PlayStation 3 network went down, I don't remember what year it was. I think it was about a decade ago or so. Uh, and it was down for like six months. That did kill uh, Zipper Interactive, by the way. They released, uh, I think, the, it was the, the last SOCOM game, which requires, I think it was a SOCOM game. It's been a while, forgive me. But that required an online connection to play, so people bought it, and then they couldn't play it because the entire network was down. So people stopped buying the game, so the sales sucked. So they looked at the sales and went, well, your game bombed, so uh, buy Zipper Interactive. Dirk as Rat says the emulation, cap yeah. the emulation cap capabilities for the Vita were off the rails. Sony was not happy when it cut into PlayStation 1 Classics revenue. So my stance on that, I don't even know if, I know Sony might say it cut into PlayStation 1 Classics revenue, and it might have a little bit, but I don't subscribe to the idea that a pirated game is a lost sale. No, a pirated game is a game that someone probably wasn't going to buy to begin with. Uh, I am not pro or anti-piracy, just uh, I. but I realize that people are just going to do it. There's nothing that I can say that's going to change their mind one way or another. But I hard disagree with when a company comes out and goes, this game was pirated 2.5 million times. That's 2.5 million cells we've lost. No. Because if they were unable to pirate that game, that does not translate into you getting 2.5 million sales of that game. I would be surprised if it was even 10% of that number that you would get if they couldn't access piracy. Piracy exists. I do not think it is as big of a deal as people make it out to be. Is it stealing? Yeah, I think so. You're stealing someone's intellectual property. But it's all 
digital, so there's no tangible product, so it's not costing you anything. Furthermore, like I said, I discount the notion that every pirated copy of a game is one missing game cell. I'd imagine that most pirates, if they couldn't pirate something, were just never going to play it anyways. Or find some other way to get it for even cheaper. Trade it for a friend, go to a friend's house, stuff like that. So yeah, uh, PlayStation Portable seems to be decently hackable. I'd expect more of these exploits in the future if these two engineers could get away with it through a software, through a software boot. Then uh, sounds like the, the sounds like the architecture is there to get away with a lot more stuff. Uh, I'm sure this might have opened a door for a lot of people to start taking a closer look at the PlayStation Portal. Moving on to that coder story I was alluding to earlier. Once again, we're sticking with IGN. Saber Interactive CEO says Coder Remake is alive and well. I'll believe it when I see it. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic Remake is one of gaming... To the article itself, sorry. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic Remake is one of gaming's most elusive projects. Announced in 2021, the long rebated remake has changed hands multiple times, seemingly stopped development and restarted again, and after six years of development has yet to manifest. Fortunately, we have a real concrete update on what's going on. Saber Interactive is still working on it, and according to their CEO, it's alive and well. Speaking to IGN in an interview today, Saber Interactive CEO Matthew... Oh, hey there. Weird. Saber Interactive CEO Matthew Karch confirmed that the company took Coder with it during its split from Embracer Group and that the game is still in active development. Uh, by the way, it's in active development, but I have heard that Sony was at one time a quasi-partner on this and I believe has completely just washed their hands on this. They want nothing to do with it anymore, which would explain why it's taking so long to get off the ground, because it's just been rebooted multiple times. Which is weird, because you would figure that a IP as beloved as Knights of the Republic would be giving... No offense to Saber, but it's like giving Silent Hill to Bloober. What, what, what's going on here? Why, why isn't... Why isn't Insomniac or Naughty Dog or The Coalition or, or any other, like, big, big-name team working on this? It's Saber. Okay. Weird. Back to the article. It's clear and obvious that we're working on this, he said. It's been in the press numerous times. What I will say is that this game is alive and well, and we're dedicated to making sure that we exceed consumer expectations. Karak would not offer further details, but in a festive call following the announcement of Saber's departure, Embracer CEO Lars Wingfurs implied the Coder remake may still be a long way. The game has undergone a long limbo, having been announced in 2021 after three years of development at Aspire, paused indefinitely due to a lack of progress, and revived again at Saber Interactive. There have been minimal official updates since. First of all, glad it's gone from Aspire. I just don't trust this property at Saber. It's, it's too big of a name. Its legacy is too huge. Uh, I don't think Saber can treat it. They, they could be an... Ex they I am so reluctant to say this is amateur hour because Saber does good work and they're decently talented. I just think this is too big for them. Much like how I do like a lot of what Bloober Team does, but they've made some duds in the past, and I'm really concerned about the Silent Hill 2 remake. It's, it's too big for them. Take a look at chat here. Uh, oh, that, okay, we got a weird... Ah, <laughs> sorry. My, uh... This is all kinds of weird on my end. I just suddenly realized that... My border's all kinds of messed up. Whatever that happened earlier, I think, knocked all kinds of stuff just loose. Give me one second here. Let me... Let me adjust things on the fly in a super, super professional way. Because that, that's how we roll here on this show. One second. Everything is off-centered. Everything's all gone. This is all kinds of bad. This is all kinds of what happened here? Oh my god, what happened? Well, this is a problem to figure out later. Show must go on. I think that there are some 
studios that are talented, but they're biting more than they biting off more than they can chew. I think Saber is one of them. I think Bloober is one of them. And I don't have much hope for this Coda remake at all. Just at all. And it is unfortunate, but it is what it is. Let's see. Dirk is rad. Walking away from a Coda reboot of any kind seems like leaving money on the table. Uh, to a degree. But if it's taken you six years and you don't even have anything to show for it, there comes a point where you have to cut bait. Uh, that is a lot of money just eaten up by labor alone. Because they're paying all those people to work on something that hasn't materialized for six years. And people could be looking at that going, wait a minute, it's been six years, we've spent all this money on it, and you still have nothing to show for it? A remake of this caliber, and you've got nothing yet, might still mean it has another three to five years of development? Uh, and with, with the economy going as it is, and capital drying up, and loans being extremely expensive right now because interest rates are so high... There ain't no appetite for that risk. So, yeah, after a while, you have to definitely cut bait. Furthermore, if Sony was involved uh, behind the scenes of, with funding this thing, you have to imagine that's yet another one of Jim Ryan's failures. <laughs> There's a reason why he's gone. Uh, and it would make sense that if Sony pulled out, they got rid of Jim Ryan, they have someone new in place as an interim CEO. It would make, once again, not Sony, PlayStation, use an unchangeable here. Uh, it would make sense why they would have pulled out. The logic tracks. Yeah, I put a lot of time into Coder as well, too. Like, uh, an ungodly amount of time. I am so annoyed about this overlay thing right here. I, I want to see if I could do one thing here real, real quick. Okay, that's a little bit, that's a little bit better. Forgot how to actually operate things live. All right. The joys of doing a live show, by the way. I have a couple more stories here. They're more entertainment. They're, they're video game adjacent. We go to Variety for both of them. First up here, Amazon's Fallout to film second season in California with a $25 million tax credit, thus confirming that they have already greenlit a season two to the upcoming Fallout TV series on Amazon Prime, to the article itself. Fallout, the post-apocalypse series debuting this week on Amazon Prime, is expected to relocate to California for its second season thanks to $25 million in California tax credits. The first season was produced mostly in New York with some film in Utah. I'm not going to get to particulars of the business side of the show other than to say that apparently the buzz around this Fallout TV show is good enough for Amazon to, to sight unseen, give a green light to a second season. I am cautiously optimistic about this show the trailer certainly seems to capture the vibe it doesn't look cheap uh sometimes some amazon prime shows have a certain let's say cw level of quality this doesn't seem to be one of them but i still don't know how fallout can work as a tv show uh, i know that first episode was floating around i have not seen it i'm gonna wait for the whole thing to drop and then kind of binge it if worthy or stop if not, I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, let me know when you guys take a look at that. I, I, I don't know. I want it to be good. But apparently I have enough faith in it to do a second season. Also, while talking about movies, we get once again Sigma Variety. Dread, Black Salt Games' Dredge is getting a live-action film adaptation. Weird. Now, Dredge is an indie game that came out a little while ago. Essentially, it crosses deep sea fishing with Cthulhu. I know that seems weird. I loved this game. I thought it was really cool. It's a decently short playthrough. Atmospheric, creepy. Not scary, but there are definitely some unsettling moments. As far as turning it into a movie, I can kind of see... A movie based on Dredge, it's not like there was much plot to it to begin with. There is an overall story, but you're not talking thousands and thousands of pages here. So it can be condensed down to a movie, in my opinion. To the article. Ah. Critically acclaimed indie video game Dredge is getting the film treatment. Black Salt Games has partnered with production company Story Kitchen to create a live-action feature adaptation of the single-player Lovecraftian fishing adventure with a sinister undercurrent. And the game players are invited to sell their catch, upgrade the boat, and dredge the depths of the long-buried secrets as they explore a mysterious archipelago 
and discovered why some things are best left forgotten. The, officials, the game's official tagline is, Think the Sixth Sense on the Water. A grounded atmospheric cosmic core blend of HP Lovecraft and Ernest Hemingway. Okay. I don't get the Sixth Sense vibes at all from when I played Dredge. I think that's just them trying to tie it into a spooky movie and get, get, get clicks. But HP Lovecraft of Ernest Hemingway, that I can buy. Specifically like Old Man of the Sea. I want to see where they go with this. I don't expect it to be great. But it could be entertaining. Let's take a look back to chat here one more time. Fallout Nuka Break was a good fan made series. I've heard nothing but great things about that. Uh, video Gap, uh, Dirk says video game adaptations are the new comic book adaptation. I agree. You're going to see a whole bunch of them coming up as cape movies, superhero movies start dying out. You are going to see video game adaptations getting gobbled up and produced out, especially if things like Fallout actually pop off. Uh, at this pace, Ober Din could be a series or movie by next month. Man, I would love, 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 love an Obra Din game. Ober Din was my favorite game that, that, that year it dropped, which was three or four years ago, I think, at this point. Uh, I don't think it would make a... a <laughs> the, the actual premise to Ober Din wouldn't work, but the... The backstory to Oberdin will work. Like if they took the, I don't want to spoil Oberdin. Oberdin is a game best gone into knowing absolutely nothing at all. One final story before we wrap things up. Here we go to Video Game Chronicle again for this one. Relic announces layoffs following its split from Sega. We had a little bit of reprieve from the layoffs, but they're kicking back in. A week after being sold by Sega and becoming an independent studio, Relic Entertainment has announced a round of layoffs. While the company hasn't publicly put a number on the amount of affected employees, Relic external development producer Robin Smale said the studio had, quote, lost a number of amazing people. 41. Vancouver, Canada-based Relic specializes in real-time strategy games, including the Company of Heroes, Age of Empires, and Homeworld series. Relic said the following. Letting people go is not an easy decision and was made solely with the goal of providing Relic the best possible chance to survive in an increasing volatile industry. It does not in any way reflect the expertise, passion, or character of any of the impacted employees. We are working closely with those affected providing severance packages, extended benefits, and outplacement support options. Last week, I mentioned that Relic went independent not uh, necessarily out of choice. At least this is my, my theory. I think Sega went up to Relic and went, we can shut you down or we can spin you off. Which would you prefer? And I think Relic saw a chance to become independent again and took it. That said, Relic no longer has the steadiness of a publisher like Sega there to hold them up anymore. They are completely on their own. Which means that cuts must be made. You no longer have the infrastructure you used to, so you can either try to stay bloated and collapse or become very, very ling and maybe survive. I like Relic as a company. Homeworld, uh, Company of Heroes, I think are excellent real time strategies, and that is one of my favorite genres real time strategy. I wish nothing but the best for Relic. I hope these cuts are going to be enough to be stable. However, in my experience and in my, my, my belief, I, I could be wrong. But from what I have seen, a company never cuts deep enough when they have layoffs. I am of the mindset that you cut the fat deep and hard once. What we typically often see is they trim a little bit here, and then they have to trim a little bit more here, and then they have to trim a little bit more here. And then when it's all said and done, you've laid off more people than you would have if you just would have done one big, massive round of cuts. Relic is not in a position that they can get away with that. And I think that I, and I'm hoping that's not what they're doing here. I hope 41 for Relic is more than they needed to let go. Because if they're doing that, well, we'll just let this bare minimum of people go. 
they don't have anyone else to fall back on. It's them and them alone. So if this isn't enough to guarantee that you're open through the lean times coming, and they are a coming, they're already here. It's just going to get worse. I, th I think Relic might shut down as a whole. No one necessarily wants to let people go. The image of the comically evil CEO, that, uh, like Zorg from Fifth Element, going, fire a million. Sir, we only need to fire 500,000. And he just looks at him and says, fire a million again. That actually doesn't exist. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're paragons of good either. These are people who are cared about one thing, the bottom line. But I do think that they are concerned about the public image of things rather than doing what is necessary to stay open. Now, in the case of Relic, they're a small team again. These people know everyone. Everyone is a friend. So there is a bit of like, I don't want to fire Bill. I just went out last week with him and his wife and they have a kid on the way. But if you don't fire Bill, you might have to fire Bill and three other people later. That's the question about Relic. Are they cutting deep? Or are they only doing a little prune? Because if they're only doing a little prune, I really fear for the entire city. Ah, uh, anyways, that wraps things up for the last story as well as the show itself. We'll take one final look at chat here. Uh, watch the SNL Mario Kart skit they did of Pedro Pascal. The joke is becoming all too real, 100%. Uh, I mean, we have for... Yeah, yeah, I, I see where you're going with that for sure. Uh, thank you for agreeing. I appreciate that as well. Well, that does it for the last story, and that does it for the show as well. This has been Game Points 393, and we do stream this live every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here at Twitch TV slash Game Points. Can't watch us live, however, we're at any myriad of video hosting platforms, YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, etc. You can follow me on X at CapitalistPig21. You can catch me throughout the week here streaming random games. I'm working through Classified 44 right now. Looking forward to that Stellaris patch or uh, DLC coming up soon. I'm sure we'll play something in between there as well. And there's also a Discord. You can join if you want to be a part of the Greater Game Boys community. Link provided down there with all the stories we've talked about as well. I recommend you take a look at them. Read them yourselves. Always good to go to the first-hand source for things when you can. Thank you all for showing up. This has been Game Points. And until next week, I'm out of here.